I was on a mission to show that av- marketing is more than advertising, but I started with what I knew, which was advertising. And the challenge was how do we unlock our imagination and put it to work, right? right. Because people were, we were trying to remind people of the inventiveness of this 130 year old right. company. How did it all start? When did you dream about this? And what you actually wound up doing, is it something you dreamt about in in kindergarten, in high school? (laughs) Certainly not in kindergarten or high school. I grew up in a small town in Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And um, I liked my small town environment. I went to college in my state. I mean, I, the world I knew was the world I liked. And so the idea of having the career I've had, being able to see the world in the way I have was beyond what I thought possible. That being said, I can tell you, I remember in fifth grade, uh, I loved geography. It was one of my favorite subjects and just seeing the world. I went to college, I studied biology and anthropology. And so I think in there, I see the seeds of what became my career, Mm -hmm. a real curiosity about human behavior. And originally I thought I was going to go to medical school. I punted that because I wanted to be a science reporter. And I ended up getting into marketing and working for one of the biggest companies on earth. So I couldn't have planned that. Let's pivot to the book. The uh, the title is Imagine It Forward, Courage, Creativity, and the Power of Change by Beth Comstock. You know, the title, I'm sure, I mean, anyone that worked on a book, there are many titles that fly through the brain as you're developing it. What were some of the title ideas and why did you ultimately settle on Imagine It Forward? Yeah, it's funny you ask that. I've been cleaning out some. It was The, the book's a long process and I've been cleaning out files and I found just pages and pages. We had... I bet we had a hundred different titles. At least I had a hundred different titles in my in my head. And I, for me, imagination has always been this theme. As I put the book together, it was a thread that I carried through. So I knew I wanted something around uh, imagination and, frankly, mm-hmm. the dearth of imagination that I worry about in our organizations today. So that was sort of the problem I was trying to solve, and I love the optimism of it. But there was also a key theme of sort of granting yourself permission um, to make change and to take a risk and to try something. So this permission granted, I kept coming back to that. Um, and, um, I, after a while, my editor would be like, okay, next chapter is going to be, you failed, you failed, you failed, then you succeeded. Like, I was like, (laughs) yeah, is it that boring? And he goes, no, it's not boring. It's just, that's the formula. And I said, yeah, you know, it's almost like fail forward. Aha, that, how's that for a title? And he's like, no, not very positive. But we had a lot of around, a lot of uh, themes around those kind of things. But the idea of imagination was really the, to me, that what I had the most passion for. And of course, it brings to mind the imagination campaigns we've all seen in 15, 16. I remember those full page ads in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, well, I think when I was at GE and I was named chief marketing officer the first in two decades. And so there had, I mean, GE had had great advertising. Um, I was on a mission to show that av- marketing is more than advertising. But I started with what I knew, which was advertising. And the challenge was how do we unlock our imagination and put it to work, right? Because right. people were, we were trying to remind people of the inventiveness of this 130 year old right. company. And so we needed to get both things right. And your imagination at work was the tagline we introduced, but it replaced an iconic tagline in we bring good things to life. Still probably, I think one of the great taglines of, right. of advertising, but GE had a hundred years of great taglines. I mean, progress is our most important product. I always liked that one. I thought that was really, yeah. really good. Uh, in the 30s, I think that was something like GE initials of a friend. I mean, you know, <laughs> my favorite one was uh, man help men helping man help men helping man. Okay. And it was right around 69 when man la- when on we landed moon. on the moon. Okay. I would say it wasn't our most diverse right. tagline, yeah, um, but you know, so it was trying to be very relevant. Men helping man, I think, is men helping men. Maybe anyway, it was so very varied taglines in a hundred and thirty year old company. Well, an interesting question, if I may. Uh, you write in the book that Jack Welch was part of the we we're bringing good things to life. Yeah. That was part. Of, so how hard did you have to fight? I know it was when Jeff was already yeah. in. But did you have to fight because it was part of, it was close to Jack? Yeah, well, I I had to fight just the belief that uh, it was almost as if Thomas Edison had etched We Bring Good Things to Life in stone and left it, you know, somewhere in a a tomb. Um, And and I remember at one point, I mean, Jack had left. This was a couple years into, uh, into Jeff's tenure, but I pitched the new campaign. I remember one executive, a, a woman I worked with, she stood up in the back of the room and 
pounded the table and said, if you do this, I quit. And um, I, it showed you how passionate people wow. are. And um, what we had to say is we bring good things to life was amazing. But what it, it held us back, what we saw is people often thought it was about an appliance and a light bulb company because it was very consumer right. focused. Right. But even more, it was most people thought it was we bring good things to light, which isn't mm. a bad. Right. But, if, that, if but if it's, it's just associated with a light bulb company. It prevents you from moving forward. And we were trying to speak much more to aviation, healthcare, right. those kind of things. So it, in some ways it held us back. That being said, I think today, this is how many years later, 20 years later, I think today even taglines probably don't serve the same purpose in the world that they used to. They're important, I think, but not in, in the same way. So if I may, what what is the role of taglines in today's world, 2019? Yeah, I, I personally think, one, I, one they have to be very brief. Okay. I, I like the idea of symbols even more because okay. we're in an emoji right. text kind of right. world. Um, but I think what taglines are good for, especially is for your employee base and connecting your employees on a company mission. Mm. And if it doesn't ring true with your employees, then it's probably not going to ring oh. true for your customers. You make so, sure it works internally yeah. even before it works externally. Right. It's a rallying cry. So I feel like that was what we were trying to do. Imagination at work was it's about an inventive culture. I don't care where you are. You have to kind of think of a new way of doing it, but you have to get to work. It's about, in our and G's case, it was sweats. We called it sweat square. People wanted to really work. So we couldn't lose that. But I think a tagline helps... Uh, your employees, why do you work where you work? Right. Ah, here's what we do. Here's our mission. Here's what we're trying to do. And there's a story behind it. And it helps everybody communicate that simply. Um, so to me, that's how that's how yeah. I'd look at it in today's world. Um, I think it's hard to break through the clutter um, sure. with, uh, with a tagline. I mean, look at all the consumer companies. How many of them still use the same tagline? I mean, Nike's just returned to Just Do It, right. which I'd argue is one of the best taglines ever but think about it, it was seeded 30 years ago could they seed that today right now it's interesting the nike tagline has of course the advantage of i don't know if it's 100 million or whatever the the ad budget is put behind it so of course I, if i may play devil's advocate for a moment almost anything you would put out with that type of media budget would be successful. Yeah. Well, there is that. I mean, I think, though, in today's media world, as you know, things are so diffuse. Yeah. And, um, I mean, Nike does a great job, obviously, but they are telling their story in very different they're very yes. different ways. Um, I thought it was interesting the way they returned to Just Do It. Uh, recently, you know, they had the amazing right. campaign. It got a lot of attention with Colin Kaepernick, right, but also course. part of that was Serena Williams and others trying right. to really – remind people of that passion right. of the of the athlete um so again it's good for employees right. uh it's good for customers and so that's how i think about taglines today is it true that uh, i remember hearing this that when michael jordan signed that contract i believe with nike um years ago that was like a turning point in celebrity endorsements it must have been. I, yeah. I, uh, I mean, you look at Jordan. What an, what an right. amazing brand right. it is. Right. Its own brand within right. the Nike portfolio. One, of, probably, I think one of the most successful yeah. licensed, if not the, yeah, if not the most yeah. successful. Right. And and what I think I learned about just my association with Nike is just that Michael Jordan's very hands on. He cares about his well, brand. Um, he didn't just delegate it. Um, and so I think it also speaks to sincerity of his intention that he's wanted to make sure the quality right. and he teamed with Nike. So they're going to do that. But uh, you can't just give your brand to somebody and assume they're going to. It's a always, great lesson. Yeah. Great lesson. So I think he's he's in he's in many of those discussions. If your name is associated with something, you have to be on top of it in order to make sure that it's the execution will meet your standard. Right. Your, you still have to delegate to good people. Right, Obviously, course. he's right. not; he didn't do right. it himself. Right. But um, I think that's a good a good partnership to look at of somebody who stayed connected but also delegated. Folks, my guest this evening is none other than Beth Comstock. She just came out with her. Uh, is this your first book, by the way? It's my first book. Yeah. Wow. Imagine it forward, but it's like it's many books in one. What I love about the book is, and I'm sharing it the first time here. It merges IQ and EQ. Mm, thank that's, you. That's, but that's really my, from going through it. And that's what I, and the folks here know I'm, I'm uh, very personable and, and I, I love the EQ part of it. In fact, I know you talk about soft skills in here. One of my guests was Captain Sully Sullenberg. Mm. And he recounted the whole, the whole flight. This is before the movie came out. 
And I'll never forget, he, um, he, he said on the air, he said, I bristle when I hear people pushing away the value of soft skills. He said, when I was there in that cockpit, him and First Officer Jeff Skiles, he said, if I remember correctly, he said, we didn't even have to talk. We just looked at each other. We knew what we had to do. He says this. chills here when you say that. And and I I I will find it and send the, mm. the clip. He said it here and it was it was it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. It was here. I mean, I and why do we call them soft skills? Right. We. It's just sort of. I uh, maybe it's like software. I, I'd in the best case, I'm hopeful <laughs> that's what people mean, but I don't think so yet. I hope we're returning uh, to a time when people recognize those are essential skills. Right. That's a great point. It's not just you know soft skills. Almost like yeah, you know, like uh, you know how valuable are their. Uh, uh, are they anyway? But meanwhile, they're critical. And certainly, you know, someone who has their, you know, uh, ear to the ground and understands the value, you know, someone that 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 has the soft skills, it's, you know, it, their value is so great, although many times on the balance sheet, it doesn't necessarily show. Yeah, and I love that example you said with, with um, Sully because it is often those unspoken communications that um, that you've gotten to know one another right. so well and that's what leadership and business yeah. and it's you form good teams you form it's it's because you've taken time to get to know each other as people not just as manager x person who sits in that desk who you know your right. job title right so imagine it forward courage creativity and the power of change by beth comstack what an amazing release of course it's at bookstores nationwide barnes and noble go anywhere it's uh, in the airports you'll you'll see it imagine it forward um we're going to continue stay tuned I love the honor of interviewing C-Level executives and sharing their great advice and perspective on Mind Your Business. I'd love to get your feedback. Post it in the comments below and subscribe. You'll never miss an edition of Mind Your Business.